Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. We're in virtual mode and have been since the start of the pandemic. In the summer, however, we've been doing a few shorter uh, videos, which we call explainers, where we take a particular issue and we ask a particular expert to expand on that particular issue. And our expert for today is William Cohan, uh, a well-known reporter and author in New York who has written extensively on financial services. Um, he was educated at Phillips Andover Academy, which is America's answer to Eton. He then went to Duke, which is the South's answer to Oxford, and he washed up at Columbia J School and Columbia Business School. Uh, he's worked for many years on Wall Street. He has written on why Wall Street matters. He's written about Goldman Sachs. He's written about many, many things. His, uh, the book that he is apparently currently writing is on GE Capital, which is an interesting one. Uh, he is also a commentator on the Financial Times and the New York Times and a number of other publications. And the article that caught my attention was on uh, fortress banks. Are the big banks of today, uh, have they positioned themselves? So it's not so much that they are too big to fail, but they simply are incapable of failure because they put themselves out in a whole range of different areas. Uh, he, but that hasn't stopped him since he published that. He's also written on why you can't make a deal on Zoom. He's written on Kathy Wood, who is the, uh, the guru of choice for those who really believe there is no ceiling to where stock markets can go. And I discover he is a founding partner in a new publishing venture, a media platform called Puck, which is in beta launch at the present time, supposed to launch properly in September, and uh, will, I assume, in an interesting and amusing way, uh, focus on the intersection in America's power centers between Hollywood, Silicon Valley, New York City, Wall Street, and Washington, D.C. On its website, apparently, it defines its uh, topics as uh, its areas of interest as power, money, and ego. But let's start with the idea of the banks. Our are they, is this idea of fortress banks um, really, is, is, does it hold up? Are the banks now in completely impregnable to the kind of uh, threat that fintechs, for instance, we hoped might uh, pose to them? I give you William Cohan. William. Mm. Well, thank you for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. So I think you have to put into perspective what happened in banking uh, in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, uh, you know we all know, you know, in this country that you know Bear Stearns basically went down the tubes, was bought by J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, uh, Lehman Brothers, of course, went bankrupt in a spectacular way, and pieces of which were bought by Barclays, among among others. Uh, Merrill Lynch uh, went down the tubes, was bought by Bank of America. Morgan Stanley almost went down the tubes, uh, only to be rescued by uh, a bank in Japan. Goldman Sachs uh, was rescued uh, by Warren Buffett and the public uh, equity markets. And of course, everyone uh, was rescued by the Fed uh, and the Treasury and, and the Congress, uh, all, those, all the banks were. And of course, something similar happened uh, throughout Europe. And so, you know, in in the United States, anyway, what you had is, um, you know, uh, and this evolution has been going on for some time, uh, where you had many, many competitors, and now you have basically a cartel uh, of Wall Street banks. Uh, you know, uh, you, you, there's you know very few options now. We have uh, what in Europe you like to refer to as national champions. Suddenly, uh, in America, we now have national champions, and when you have national champions, whether they're called uh, J.P. Morgan uh, Chase or Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or Societe Generale or Barclays, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the central banks um, and, you know, the nation as a whole doesn't, you know, can't afford those banks getting into trouble. I mean, they can't afford those banks disappearing because banks, are, of course, lubricate uh, the entire world economy at this point, which is, uh, uh, you know, essentially... Uh, a capitalistic across the whole world. So banks are the left ventricle of capitalism. And uh, as a result of all that happening, uh, banks now are 
uh, are national champions. They're very, very powerful. They have huge moats around them. Uh, and that's not going to change uh, because without banks, we don't have capitalism. Without capitalism, you know, it's apparently it seems we would have a uh, huge uh, chaos and disorder. So uh, uh, as a result, you know, the big banks in the US are more powerful, better capitalized, uh, probably safer uh, than they were before the financial crisis. Um, you know, JP Morgan Chase is making $40 billion of profit a year. Uh, you know, its market cap is close to $500 billion. I, I think that that is uh, not something uh, for Jamie Dimon to worry about. So that's <laughs> that's why I believe these banks have become fortresses uh, with huge moats in front of them. And, you know, the fintechs are sort of like, you know, little gnats uh, on these elephants. Where's uh, the cutoff? Let, let me ask you, where's the cutoff? Uh, but above what level are the banks completely safe? I mean, obviously, JP Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, okay, they're up there. Wells Fargo, some of the some of the other banks, are they also, uh, in, is it also inconceivable that the government should permit them to fail? No, I don't, I don't think this is necessarily, a, a, you know, a line that the government uh, you know, has created and for which they will not, uh, you know, they, they will not cross them to allow them to fail. Look, I think banks don't fail, as I pointed out in, in this uh, FT piece, the b- banks don't fail because, say, with Credit Suisse, they've damaged their reputation through three uh, straight uh, 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 self-inflicted wounds. Uh, banks fail because they do what they've done wrong forever uh, in a fractional banking system, which is borrow short and lend lending long. And so uh, when you can no longer borrow short and you have lended long, uh, then you are extremely vulnerable uh, to a run on the bank and a loss of confidence because banking is essentially a confidence game. So if you uh, uh, if confidence in the bank has been lost, and, and that usually shows up as an unwillingness by short-term lenders to lend money to the banks, wh- uh, whether that's depositors who are the ultimate short-term lenders or overnight repo market or commercial paper market, whatever it happens to be, that's that's the problem because banks make money by borrowing short, i.e. inexpensively, and lending long, i.e. more expensively to customers around the world. Uh, they capture that spread, and that's how they make, you know, forty. One of the ways they make forty billion dollars a year. So it's not that you know banks won't fail or can't fail or are protected from failing. It's at the moment, uh, at least you know, uh, in in Western Europe and in the U.S., uh, central banks have mandated that um, uh, banks have more capital, uh, are are in the moving business rather than the storage business. I.e., they don't. Uh, uh, keep assets for very long on their balance sheet, and certainly not the riskier ones that they used to keep. And so it's just a question, ultimately, of whether uh, 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 short-term lenders lose uh, confidence in banks. And if that happens, then there's really nothing that anybody can do, unless uh, you know, we, as we've seen, that you know, the Fed just steps in in a huge way. What about uh, the threat posed by fintechs or by upstart banks or by non-banks, by the shadow banking system, by competitors? Do they actually have any competitors in your view? I don't think the big banks have really any competitors except for themselves. They have gnats that are, you know, taking little pieces of their business. Uh, you know, so fintechs are, are obviously uh, increasingly a powerful in the payments processing area, uh, you know, and that's you know one of the things that Jamie Dimon tells me, you know, he he worries about, which you know I get that. I mean, you know, Visa, Mastercard, American Express, Stripe, Square, uh, you know, these companies are taking some payments processing business, you know, away from the big banks, you know, but it really hasn't affected J.P. Morgan's profitability. So uh, you know, I wouldn't be all that concerned. You know, it, it, it sounds great, you know, because I'm sure in his heart of hearts, Jamie Dimon knows that he doesn't have any 
competitors. And so, uh, you know, he has to say publicly that he's worried about them uh, so that, you know, it makes it seem like uh, he's not a, a monopoly. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, beyond fintech, uh, you've got sort of uh, the shadow, the so-called shadow banking system that you referenced uh, that uh, has sprung up in the wake of the 2010 Dodd-Frank law, which sort of required that banks uh, do less or hold on their balance sheet less risky assets. And so that's created an opportunity for this so-called shadow banking market to appear to, to make loans uh, and hold loans that the banks can't, uh, can't hold anymore. Or, you know, players like big private equity firms like Blackstone or KKR or Apollo that are also getting into the business of making loans that some of the banks won't make anymore. What about um, the possibility? What should Jamie Dimon be worried about? Are there are there threats out there that either he he doesn't know about or that he doesn't wish to talk about? Um, he'll big up instead the gnats that are dipping around his legs. But are there tsunamis that are growing on the horizon that he really ought to be worried about? Well, obviously, he, you know, as Lloyd Blankfein, the, the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, once said to me, he spends 98% of his time worrying about things with a 2% probability. And, and of course, that's what Jamie Dimon uh, should be worried about as well. That's what every bank CEO should be worried about, that, that unexpected uh, financial crisis, that trigger, uh, you know, we're like, we're ripe for a major financial crisis now, given, you know, now 10 plus years of, of easy money, central bank uh, intervention, uh, expansion of central bank balance sheets, uh, 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 manipulating interest rates to the lowest levels in human history, uh, causing uh, investors around the world to take uh, huge risks that they're not getting compensated for. So how that uh, is going to play out is of course, Jamie Dimon's biggest risk. Now he's, you know, by by mandate, by regulation, he's moved a lot of those risky assets off his balance sheet, you know, into the uh, arms of investors around the world. Um, but you know, again, it's a confidence game. So once the confidence goes, uh, he's at risk. So he has to worry about people losing confidence in the banking system, which, as we saw in two thousand eight, can happen, does happen, happens you know, sort of once every 20 years, even though everybody sort of forgets that it can happen or will happen. Uh, so that's what he needs uh, to worry about. And he has to make sure that um, he's got enough capital uh, uh, on his balance sheet uh, to withstand, you know, a quasi, you know, run on the bank. And, and runs on the bank, by the way, aren't like they used to be where you sort of stand around uh, the bank and wait for it to open. So, uh, you know, depositors can take their money out because the FDIC now, of course, guarantees depositors to $250,000. Uh, and that's about probably 99% of the people, uh, you know, uh, are covered that way. It's the institutional investors who get scared or lose confidence and take their money out and then start blabbing about it and and or uh, have bet, you know, take their money out and then buy puts uh, to, you know, uh, perfect uh, their blabbing uh, and make money from their blabbing. So again, it's this this is what you, you you have to worry about. And, you know, we're at a time now in the market where, you know, markets are at an all time high, the stock market is an all time high, the bond market has never been higher. This is very, very precarious and very, very risky. Uh, can't be easy to be uh, a big bank CEO right now. But on the other hand, it's probably better to be a big bank CEO than to be a small bank CEO. Is there not a situation in which you could envisage that the JP Morgans and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley's of this world become rather like the dollar, the safe haven of choice, even if the crisis that is caused is caused by the, the Americans themselves, as we've seen in the, the course of the, of the last week after Afghanistan, the dollar has actually strengthened. Yeah, I think I think that uh, you know, look compared to banks, other banks around the world. I mean, the U.S. banks, Wall Street banks are you know, I'm sorry to say, they're the world leaders uh, of uh, both 
market cap, you know, actual capital, market capital, market valuation, and intellectual capital. I mean, that Wall Street is the 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 you know the 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 brain center of world finance, uh, and other banks are sort of working hard to catch up and be competitive. But you know, those three or four banks uh, that you mentioned, uh, plus Bank of America, which owns Merrill Lynch. You know that's that's it. Those are the big. Those are the big four. They probably ain't going anywhere soon. Okay, and let me ask they, you a little bit about uh, your venture with Punch. I mean, Punch presumably Puck. Punch Puck Puck Puck. Puck. <laughs> Sorry, the defunct Punch was a magazine that was entirely uh, restricted to dentist waiting rooms in Britain about thirty years ago. Uh, part of my youth. Sorry, Puck 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 really looks at. Um, I guess insofar as it looks at bankers and finance, it looks at bankers as rock stars. It's the intersection of Hollywood and Wall Street. It's uh, Jamie Dimon as a rock star. Is that would that be unfair uh, characterization of of how you're going to view Puck when it actually hits the newsstands or when it appears in people's inboxes? Well, look, uh, I've never uh, sought to uh, lionize or make a rock star out of anybody uh, that I that I write about, and especially not Wall Street executives. It's a it's a uh, a fair and honest uh, look at at Wall Street based. You know, I spent seventeen years working on Wall Street as an M and A banker, so uh, you know I know the territory, and that's sort of what I've always brought to my uh, my journalism. Uh, you know. It's kind of a warts and all uh, situation, and you know, I I, I will I will never uh, 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 lionize these guys or, or, or women and and make them into rock stars. They are what they are. They are, you know, uh, the leaders of of some of the most powerful financial institutions on earth. Uh, they have made themselves extremely wealthy uh, managing these companies, especially over the last. You know, five plus years where the, their market caps have skyrocketed and their profitability has skyrocketed for the reasons we were talking about before. So, you know, Puck is just there to do proper journalism uh, and to reveal to readers, uh, you know, what these, uh, at least my aspect of, of, of Puck, uh, is what Wall Street is really all about, which is what I've been doing since I left Wall Street in 2004. But you do on the website talk about money, power, and ego. Um, and that does suggest um, that you're going to take at the very least a fairly caustic view of the uh, enormous wealth that has been uh, accrued on Wall Street by these people who are, after all, are they public servants? Are they entrepreneurs? What do they actually have at risk? Yes, they will. We know, we know that managers of corporations have very little at risk. Uh, uh, you know, it seems to me that, um, you know, and I've been writing about the failures of the compensation system on Wall Street for many, many years. So I've stopped writing about it because nobody cares anymore. Uh, I'm not sure they cared. They, they cared a little bit after the financial crisis because people wondered how the heck that happened. And one of the reasons it happened is because that's what bankers and traders got rewarded to do, uh, to take risks. Uh, and so if you want people to take less risk, then you have to change how they're compensated and how they're rewarded. Uh, I mean, look, uh, it's going to, Puck is going to take a gimlet eye view of, of you know, the reality of, of Wall Street, of Hollywood, of Washington. Uh, and we're going to try to do our best to uh, bring sort of an insider's view of that to our readers. Are you going to have UK writers? I'm curious. Will the City of London get a get a look in? I mean, I think it depends on how successful uh, we are here. Uh, with more success, uh, you know, if if subscribers take to us, it's a subscription business. If if Great. if if people take to us, then of course we will expand to mm -hmm. other geographies. British writers are cheap. Uh, the City of London <laughs> is in itself. An interesting place. Journalists probably are less well paid here relative to, Wall, to relative to the city than journalists in New York are paid relative to Wall Street. Uh, but can I thank you uh, indeed and, and wish you well with Puck. Also thank wish you. you well. Tell us just quickly, when is your book on General Electric coming out? 
uh, next year. Uh, it is finished. It is with my editors. Um, and so we'll see how that process goes and we'll get it out hopefully by a year from now. Uh, are, are there any lessons from it that you would like to share with us? Jack Welsh was um, for a long time a hero and then suddenly a villain. Yes. I mean, once again, you see the dangers of uh, relying too heavily on borrowing short and lending long. The, the saga of GE Capital, uh, you know, and the uh, uh, false profits that, uh, and extensive profits that that side of the business generated without really understanding the risks that existed in that business probably uh, are as responsible as anything for the downfall of that company. I guess if we understood the risks, we probably wouldn't take them. Can I thank William Cohan? Can I thank all of you for watching? Many thanks.